Hi, I'm Paul Bartowitz from Gale Farm Ministries, a veteran outreach ministry. Uh, we're working, trying to work with veterans, reaching out to them, letting them know they're not abandoned, that uh, society hasn't forgotten about them. Uh, we pay tribute to them in some ways, but we have a tendency to forget about them in other ways. Uh, they've gone through a lot and suffer a lot. Some have wounds that you can see. We have a lot of veterans coming back today with amputated legs, amputated arms from IEDs. Uh, but there are also internal scars, scars of the heart, scars of the psyche, based on things they've seen, things they've had to do, things they've heard. Uh, and this affects them. They don't talk about this all the time. A lot of times we may talk about the things that uh, were fun and places we've been. Like I like to talk about Marseille, going into Marseille, France and getting to travel up to Monaco to see the Grand Prix in 1982. Or we talk about funny things that have happened to us in the service. When I was in the, started out in the Navy and we were doing our small arms qualification, the range master standing there going ready on the right, ready on the left, ready on the firing line, fire at will. And one of the members of our platoon dove underneath the table and the instructor looked at him and said, why are you underneath the table? He says, my name is Will and I don't want him firing at me. Uh, we tell those stories. Uh, the crazy Mike who pulled the pin on the hand grenade and threw the pin and stand there holding a live grenade that the instructor had to grab and throw from him because he panicked. Uh, you know, it's things like that that we will sh share with people. But there are a lot of things that we don't share with people. And over the last several months, I have been handing out these pins uh, that were designed by a wonderful lady out of Nebraska, Monica Harvey, with Veterans Music Ministry. She originally called the pin the Healing Heart Badge. Uh, veterans in their infinite wisdom have renamed the pin to the Band-Aid for the Heart. Uh, and they've been well received by the veterans. Uh, and when I give them and pin them on to a person or just hand them the pin and tell them a little bit about my story, they, they have a tendency to open up and share with me uh, some of the things that they've held buried that they wouldn't share with just anybody on the street. Uh, you know, it's been a phenomenal experience working with them. As much as a, It's been as much of a healing experience for me as it has been a healing experience for them. Uh, some of the stories I've heard, you know, war is not a pretty thing. Combat is not a, a well-organized, well-orchestrated thing. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. And in the chaos, things happen, accidents happen. Um, you know, it's hard to describe. You know, you get the guy from Nebraska that goes out and gets seasick on the beach when he joined the Navy. He stands on the beach and gets seasick just watching the waves rolling because he's never seen the ocean before. Uh, we see the we when we see a veteran or we see the military, we see all the the shine and the polish. We see the Class A uniforms. We don't see the dirt and the blood and the grit and the grime and the bodies in the foxholes. We don't see that and we don't want to equate that to our military. We try to think of them as the heroes, the spit and shine and polish people that everybody envisions the military to be. Yet things happen out in the battlefield uh, in combat. You know, you look at some vet's hands and you see nice, clean, manicured fingernails and polished skin and soft supple skin but when he looks at his hands he might see the blood of his comp his buddy that he carried out of the jungle in Vietnam or Korea uh, uh, laying by the roadside in, in Iraq or Afghanistan injured from a, an explosive device what combat is chaos it's blood sweat and tears to use the name of a, a 60s band uh, 
these men don't readily talk about their experiences to outsiders, uh, but they will open up to people who have been there. And that's my goal is to assemble a team of people, a uh, board of directors and assistants, people who can help me counsel and work with veterans to get the help they need, get to places they need to be to get the help they need. Uh, while I've been working recently as a sales internet manager slash sales consultant for a car dealership and I've had the advantage of meeting a lot of the veterans that come in here and passing out the pins and talking to them in my office or in the waiting room or in the showroom or wherever we have a chance to talk. And some of the stories, you know, I'm learning a lot about history, I'm learning a lot about these people. Uh, I, one of my first experiences was a gentleman that lived down the street from me that I found out was a PBY pilot that saw spotted the Japanese fleet at the bat, at Wake Island to help alert the American fleet where they were, which was a turning point in World War II. Uh, a gentleman I met here at the dealership was involved with the landing at Incheon and the short window time we had to get the Marines ashore at Incheon. And, he also was at Chosin Reservoir, and one of the few men in his unit that escaped from Chosin. Uh, he didn't escape unscathed. He lost a couple of his toes to frostbite. Uh, well, at Walmart, I met another gentleman who was present at Ladron Valley, which was the opening, basically the opening battle, pitched battle of Vietnam, where. Our 7th Cavalry went up against what they thought was going to be about three or 400 North Vietnamese Army regulars, and it turned out to be 4,000 troops that were sequestered in tunnels all around the valley. Uh, and it wasn't a short battle, it was a several-day affair uh, with uh, the lulls in the battle and the pitches in the battle and everything else, and he told me some of the stories. He uh, the thing he remembered the most was the smells, the smell of the cordite in the air, the smell of blood, his uniform being so saturated with people with his buddy's blood that it, when he got back to the base it just crinkled. He took it off and threw it away. Uh, I met a Navy corpsman who was attached to the Marines who had nightmares of the men that he couldn't save. Their faces paraded through his mind in an endless procession. My brother was a CB in Da Nang. He's suffering from the ravages of Agent Orange now. Uh, can't do the wood carving that he used to love to do because his hand isn't as steady as it used to be. Uh, my brother-in-law, who was in the swift boats working in the Mekong with the SEALs during Vietnam. And you know, I didn't know it at the time because they, my brother and brother-in-law was so much older than I am. But now that I've seen it and I've been working with these men and I've experienced it, he was suffering from the ravages of PTSD and the relationship from his, he had alienated himself from his family and his friends. And my nephew, who spent several years homeless in the Boston area, he was in Panama and in the Sinai. Uh, he's another one suffering from PSD. He can't. He has trouble holding a job, and he's 100% disabled. Uh, there was an Air Force officer that I met that was a launch officer in the silos out in the West. Uh, and whenever a launch command came in, he had trouble reconciling himself to pushing that button and entering the codes because he wasn't sure if this was really going to be the launch that when he climbed out of the silo, most of the country was going to be gone because we were at, truly at war with the Soviet Union. Uh, there's the Army vet who can't stand to go see the fireworks display with his family because A, he can't stand the crowds, he gets claustrophobic, and he's always scanning around to see if there's somebody, an enemy there. And second of all, the sound and the smell bothers him because it reminds him so much of Vietnam. Uh, You know, there were the sailors who lined up to get, donate blood for a wounded helicopter pilot while we were in Grenada. Uh, soldier on guard, guard duty who was ordered not to interfere when some Viet Cong were inviscerating a suspect, suspected sympathizer of the Americans. Uh, those are just a few of the stories I have heard, and there are 
these stories mean to me is more that veterans, we came to admit need, we can't admit the need that we have. We bury a lot of the, the pain and suffering and turmoil in the back of our head. It is my desire to expand this ministry instead of just being a part-time ministry. I'd like to be able to travel more and meet with veterans on their own turf, meet them where they gather and congregate, go to moving wall venues, go to Patriot Rider venues, go to American Legion meetings, VFW meetings, meet them, talk to them, and let them know there is a God that cares, that there is a God that they felt may have turned his back on them while they were in the ditch, ditches, uh, ditches and trenches fighting the war, that he didn't turn their back on them. They, he truly had their back the whole time, and he truly cares for them and loves them. Uh, I have some land that could be available to me. I'd like to turn into a retreat for veterans, a place where they can come and just commune with nature and heal and talk to, to people and get an idea that there is people, there are people who care for them. I just have this vision, I have this desire in my heart, I have this feeling in my heart that it's truly what I'm supposed to be doing and I'm trying to put together a team that can help me do that, that we can raise the money to support me in reaching out to them, these veterans, these men in need, that we have a tendency to think they're not in need. You know, you may not know who's a veteran. When I grew up, I thought everybody was a veteran. My father was a veteran. The people he hung around with were veterans. And then I find out later in my life that it, True veteran, we, veterans only make up about 1% of the population. And while we do honor them on Memorial Day and Veterans Day, and you know we have special events on the 4th of July, we'll recognize them, we don't reach into their, mind, their hearts and let them know we truly care for them, that we truly care about their needs and their desires, that we truly care about their ache and, that is in their heart, the ache that is in their heart and the pain and suffering that they've seen and they feel in themselves. And it's a vision of mine that we reach out and do this. And I'm asking anybody who feels it in their heart to help me, whether it's through time or donations, whatever move you, that you or even prayer, that we can do what we have to do to make these guys, these men, these brave men and women feel welcome. I mean, I know a nurse who is unable to practice her profession anymore because she was in a MASH unit in Vietnam. And it so much bothered her, those that she couldn't save, that she couldn't bring herself to, to work in an emergency room or work in a hospital where she would lose anybody else. We have to reach out to these people. We have to put an arm around them. We have to be a shoulder for them to cry on. We have to be a shoulder for them to lean on. So please, I ask of you to help me realize this dream that we can make them feel wanted, welcomed. Remember, we have a whole generation of warriors that weren't welcome back to this country. They were afraid to wear their uniform. They were ashamed to wear their uniform because of the way they were treated. I know I'm rambling, but it's so much a part of me that we take care of these people that I just want to reach out and ask for the help and the prayer and the support that we can do this. And I thank you for any attention you may give this video, and I love you all. Have a wonderful day.